This chapter is divided into two topics. The first half will discuss the structures of solids and liquids, particularly the forces that hold matter in these states. And the second part will discuss a large branch of chemistry that studies carbon-based compounds called organic chemistry. Now let's begin with the first half. A substance takes on a specific physical state, solid, liquid, or gas, as a result of a competition between two types of forces, potential energy forces and kinetic energy forces. The potential forces that maintain matter in specific states come from electrostatic forces, the interaction between charged particles, which have both attractive and repulsive components. The strength of this interaction depends on the polarities of the molecule. Later in this chapter, we'll discuss the various types of electrostatic forces that can exist between both polar and nonpolar molecules, which we call intermolecular forces. Now, the force that results in the kinetic energy of molecules come from all kinds of motion. As you may recall, at a given temperature, a molecule has a certain kinetic energy. The lower the temperature, the slower the molecule and the lower its kinetic energy. At high temperature, molecules move faster and have higher kinetic energy. A substance will stay in the condensed phase, which is what we call solids and liquids, if the potential forces are stronger than the kinetic forces. If the kinetic forces are able to break all the intermolecular forces, the molecule will become a gas, as shown here with water. A solid is formed when intermolecular attraction is very strong relative to the kinetic energy. Low kinetic energy occurs at lower temperature, so it makes sense that we see solids forming at lower temperatures relative to liquid and gas forms of the same substance. Because of the relatively strong intermolecular forces, solid doesn't really change its shape. The kinetic energy is not enough to break any of the intermolecular forces. In liquids, the substance's attraction still exists, but because of the higher temperature, each molecule has enough kinetic energy to temporarily break from the intermolecular forces only to reform it with another molecule. This gives rise to the observation that liquid changes its shape to match its container. Now in a gas, the intermolecular forces are completely overcome by the kinetic forces, which are very strong at the high temperature where this phase is formed. In fact, our model of a gas is of molecules moving past each other really fast where there is an insignificant amount of intermolecular attraction occurring. Now it's important to know the difference between the terms intra versus intermolecular forces. The forces that hold a species in the solid or liquid state are intermolecular. The forces that hold atoms together are intramolecular. The textbook example of an intramolecular force is the covalent bond. This picture of three water molecules shows the difference between the intramolecular force present in the covalent bond between hydrogen and oxygen of one water molecule. In contrast, we also have intermolecular force, which is called hydrogen bonding in this case, that is present between the hydrogen atom of one water molecule with the oxygen atom from another water molecule. So intra occurs within a molecule, while inter occurs between molecules. The changes in state have their own names as listed in the pictures. These changes in state are accompanied by energy transferred, which is symbolized by a specific enthalpy change. For example, the enthalpy of vaporization or the enthalpy of fusion. Going from a more condensed state to a less condensed state requires energy to break the existing intermolecular forces. Here, you can see that the delta H of fusion, the delta H of vaporization, and the delta H of sublimation are all positive, indicating that these are all endothermic processes. On the other hand, going from a less condensed phase to a more condensed state results in the release of energy. So delta H of condensation, freezing, and deposition are all exothermic. A closer look at the values of these enthalpies tells us there is a much larger amount of structural reorganization that takes place when a liquid becomes a gas compared to when a solid turns into a liquid. For water, for example, the enthalpy of fusion is 
only about 6 kilojoules per mole, whereas its enthalpy of vaporization is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. Now this makes sense because, as I mentioned above, a liquid still maintains most of its intermolecular interactions, whereas a gas has no intermolecular interactions at all. So conversion to a gas requires breaking all the existing intermolecular interactions, which will take a much larger amount of energy. The large difference in the two enthalpies of fusion and vaporization is observed not just for water, but also for a range of other substances as shown in this graph. But the total amount of heat or energy needed to convert a more condensed phase to a less condensed one can be calculated by constructing what we call a heating curve. Similarly, the total amount of heat release when a gas turns into a less condensed state can also be plotted and calculated using a cooling curve. Both of these topics are discussed in introductory chemistry, so if you're interested in these topics, I would go ahead and search this channel with the keywords heating curve. We will now look closer at the intermolecular forces that allow molecules to maintain their condensed states. The table below shows all the common intra and intermolecular forces. The first three, ionic, covalent, and metallic, which we had discussed in prior videos, are examples of intramolecular forces, forces that exist between atoms or ions that keep them together. These forces are very strong and hard to break. As you can see, the energy of these interactions range from the hundreds to thousands of kilojoules per mole. In contrast, the lower list here shows example of intermolecular forces, which is often abbreviated as IMF. These are forces that exist between particles. It could be between an ion and a polar species, or two polar species, or even two nonpolar species. These interactions are much weaker than the intramolecular interactions. On average, the strength is about 10 times weaker or more. These forces are the ones that keep a substance in their solid or liquid states at a given temperature. The strength of these forces for a given substance will determine the temperature at which the substance melts or boils. Before we discuss the various types of IMF, it's useful to remember three different species that give rise to these interactions. An ion is an atom that has completely lost or gained electrons. It has a full charge. A polar molecule, like HCl, is a covalent molecule where electron density is unequally distributed along the ends of the molecule. One end, or pole, has more electrons and the other pole has fewer electrons. These molecules have partial positive and negative charges. We call these molecules dipoles because they have two poles. A nonpolar molecule, like Cl2, is a covalent molecule where electron density is equally distributed along the entire molecule. These species are neutral. Now intermolecular interaction can exist between any two of these species. So for example an ion can interact with a dipole, a nonpolar molecule can interact with an ion, etc. The strength of all of these interactions vary based on Coulomb's law, which is something we had discussed in a different video. The larger the charges, and the closer they are, the stronger the interaction will be. This means Ions will have the strongest interaction, followed by a dipole, followed by nonpolars. Now let's take a look at the types of interactions we can have. We're going to start with the ion-based interactions because they're the strongest ones. The first type, of course, is the interaction of ions with another ion. Now that's just what we call an ionic bond, and typically that's considered an intramolecular interaction, although it definitely affects the melting and boiling temperature of ionic compounds. Now ions can also interact with dipoles. This is called the ion-dipole interaction. This type of interaction doesn't occur in a pure substance, but in a mixture. A textbook example is when an ionic compound is dissolved in water. Each ion will then make an ion-dipole interaction with water. Here, the interaction between the sodium ion with water is illustrated. Ions can also interact with nonpolars. Again, this happens only in mixtures, not in pure substances. So you may say, isn't a nonpolar molecule uncharged? How can it be attracted to an ion who has a full charge? Well, recall that even in nonpolar molecules, 
electrons exist all over the entire molecule. So when you bring, for example, a cation close to a nonpolar molecule, the positive charge attracts the electrons in the nonpolar molecule, resulting in a non-uniform distribution of electrons where more electrons are found on one side and fewer on the other side. Effectively, what happens is the nonpolar molecule has been induced by the ion to form a weak dipole. Once that weak dipole forms, we now can have an ion-induced dipole interaction. So now that we've looked at the type of interactions that could happen between an ion and other species, we're going to look at the next group of interactions, which is dipoles. We have discussed the ion-dipole interaction, so we're going to now look at interactions between two dipoles. There are two types of interactions that can happen between a dipole and another dipole, and the two interactions are categorized based on their strength. The stronger of these dipole-dipole interaction is called the hydrogen bond. This only exists in covalent molecules that contain hydrogen covalently bonded to a highly electronegative atom like nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Because these elements are so electronegative and hydrogen is so small, the bond becomes highly polarized, resulting in a fairly strong intermolecular interactions. An example of this is the interaction between a hydrogen in one water molecule and the oxygen in the other water molecule. All the other dipole-dipole interactions are weaker and they are just called dipole-dipole interaction. This happens with all polar molecules that have a sufficient dipole. For example, the ICL molecule is polar, so one ICL molecule can make dipole-dipole interaction with another one. Now the relative strength of hydrogen bond compared to dipole-dipole can be visualized by comparing the boiling points of several hydrogen containing polar molecules as shown here. The red line shows group 6A elements oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium all bonded to hydrogen. In sulfur, selenium, and tellurium only dipole-dipole interactions exist. Only oxygen is electronegative enough to create a hydrogen bond. As you can see the boiling point of water is much higher than what is predicted based on assuming that only dipole-dipole interactions would exist. If water only has dipole-dipole interaction, its boiling point should have been down here. So you see that same pattern occurring with all the other groups as well, with group 7a compounds, where HF being the highest boiling point compared to the other group 7, and NH3 having the highest boiling point compared to the other group 5a compounds. The last type of interactions that a dipole can make is interacting with a nonpolar species. Now just like in the case of ions, a dipole may be strong enough to distort the electron cloud in a nonpolar molecule. This makes a nonpolar molecule have an induced dipole, which can then be attracted to the permanent dipole from the polar molecule. Now an example of this type of interaction is between HCl, which is a polar molecule, and Cl2, which is a nonpolar molecule. Now the last group of interactions we'll talk about is the ones occurring in nonpolar molecules. We already talked about two of these, between a nonpolar and an ion which we call the ion-induced dipole, and between a nonpolar and a dipole, which we just discussed. Now surprisingly, even when you have two nonpolar species, they can create induced dipoles and then, as a result, have interactions that are strong enough to measure. So the sequence of events that lead to this nonpolar-nonpolar interactions goes like this. First, you have two nonpolar species, like the neon atoms in this case, they're close to each other. Now, because electrons, which surround the atom, Atom are not static species, they can move around, and so the electron density in one neon atom can randomly fluctuate. This random fluctuation may lead to a creation of a dipole in that atom. So this dipole that's created just by random fluctuation is called an instantaneous or a temporary dipole. Now once that instantaneous dipole forms, it can induce a neighboring neon atom to form a dipole as well. This is similar to what happens when you put an ion or a dipole next to a nonpolar molecule, it can induce that nonpolar species to form a dipole. Now, once the two dipoles exist, they can then make attractive interactions. That interaction is what we call the London dispersion force. It's the weakest of all the intermolecular forces, as you can see in the value of the strength, but it is responsible for allowing nonpolar molecules like noble gases or diatomic halogens to form liquids and solids. The key factor in maintaining London forces 
process is the creation of that instantaneous dipole. Formation of that instantaneous dipole depends on polarizability of the nonpolar species. Polarizability typically increases down a group and decreases across a period. The reason for this is because the valence shell is located further and further away as we go down the group, resulting in a lower effective nuclear charge for those electrons. Smaller atoms, on the other hand, on the top, have low polarizability because the valence electrons are strongly attracted to the nucleus. You can see this trend in polarizability by looking at the boiling point of noble gases and halogens. When you go down the noble gas group, it's clear that the boiling point, which is shown in the bolded numbers, increases as the size of the atom increases. A similar increase is also observed in the diatomic halogen. Another factor that would affect polarizability is molecular shape. A shape that results in electrons being located much closer to the nucleus will be harder to polarize than an elongated shape where electrons are located further away. You'll see examples of this when we talk about organic molecules that have different bonding patterns even though they have the same chemical formulas. Let's take a look at an example of using intermolecular forces to help figure out the trend in boiling point of two substances. Now the term bonding forces there is really referring to the intramolecular interactions and remember that the only one that we can actually look at that will determine boiling points is really the lattice interactions in ionic compounds, right? Because that's occurring between an ion and another ion. So that actually affects the melting point and boiling points of these ionic compounds. So let's take a look on the molecules that were given. The first one is MgCl2 versus PCl3. MgCl2 is clearly ionic. It has a metal and a non-metal in it. So that will form the ionic interaction. And as I just mentioned, ionic interaction is consisting of these lattice interactions of the cations and the anions interacting with each other. So there's no specific unit of a compound, but the whole thing just keeps repeating over space and so it's the strongest type of interactions. So that one is definitely going to result in a very high boiling point. And then if you look at PCL3, it's not ionic, then it can only be either a polar or nonpolar molecule, which means it's it's a dipole or nonpolar type of interaction that we're looking at. When drawing that out, we see that the Lewis structure looks like the phosphorus in the center with the chlorine atoms on the terminal side. And if you look at the electronegativity table as the one that's shown here, which is similar to the ones that you use, the bond between phosphorus and chlorine is a polar bond. And because of the three-dimensional structure, which is a trigonal pyramidal structure, this whole molecule is also polar. So that means that the interaction that exists there is going to be a dipole 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 interaction. So comparing ionic with dipole-dipole, the ionic is definitely stronger, and so we would predict MgCl2 to have a higher boiling point than PCl3. Now, if you actually check to compare the real boiling points, I find that the boiling point of MgCl2 is about 1700 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas for PCl3 it's only about 169, so it's actually about 10 times higher for the ionic compound compared to that dipole. Now let's take a look at the second one. Here we're comparing CH3 and H2 with CH3. H3F. And this is not an ionic compound. So again, if it's a covalent compound, you're going to have to draw the Lewis structure to determine whether it's going to be polar or nonpolar. So I've drawn the Lewis structure here for CH3NH2 and for CH3F. You know, we have the CH portion of the molecule in both, which is going to provide the same type of interactions. In this case, those are nonpolar type bonds. So they're going to generate London forces. Now you have a polar bond here between carbon and nitrogen, the same way as you have that in the CF bond. So both of those, they're going to give you dipole-dipole interaction. And then with the NH2 portion for this molecule, both of those are polarized enough of a bond to generate hydrogen bonding interaction. So that's the additional interaction that the molecule on the left has that the molecule on the right doesn't have. So that means that if I total up all the interactions that can exist, the molecule on the left will have more interactions than the one on the right. And specifically, those two additional interactions with the hydrogen bond is going to generate 
generate a higher boiling point for CH3 and H2 compared to CH3F. And again, checking this to find out the actual boiling point shows that CH3 and H2 has a boiling point of 20.66 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas CH3F has a boiling point that's very low at negative 109 degrees Fahrenheit. So clearly our prediction is correct there. Let's take a look at the third example, which is between CH3OH and CH3CH2OH. Hopefully that one is a little easier to see. Again, a covalent compound, meaning I have to draw the Lewis structure and it's given right here. So the main difference between the two molecules is really this portion of the CH3CH2 molecule because the rest of them is identical for both molecules. Now, if they're identical, that means that they're not really contributing to any difference. So the only part that's different is this portion. And this portion is a nonpolar portion of that molecule. And nonpolar portions contribute by using London forces. So because of that, because of that additional London forces that exist, we're going to expect CH3CH2OH to have a higher boiling point compared to CH3OH. Again, checking this out, I see that the larger species is at 173.1 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the lower one is at 148.5 as far as their boiling points are concerned. So it is, again, a correct prediction. The last one we are going to look at are two species that actually have the same formula, hexane and 2,2-dimethylbutane. Now, the picture's three-dimensional structure is given here because the purpose of this question is for you to understand that molecular shape affects polarizability of the molecule, as we discussed in lecture. So the more extended the shape of the molecule is, which in this case is true for that hexane molecule, is more elongated, then the easier it is to polarize that molecule. So if it's easier to polarize, that means that it will result in a stronger London dispersion force. So I would predict in this case that hexane will have a higher boiling point compared to 2,2-dimethylbutane. It shouldn't be a big difference, but there should be some kind of a difference. If we check the boiling point for hexane, we find that it's 156 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas for 2,2-dimethylbutane is 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So indeed, that shape affects the strength of the intermolecular forces that could exist. And both of these molecules have the same exact formula, which is C6H14.